Hello, everyone. Welcome to our virtual event space. So my name is Allie. You might recognize me from our Lake Forest Park location, and I'm your host for this evening. Um, I'm so excited to be introducing Angie Cruz and Ayana Mathis here to discuss Angie's new novel, How Not to Drown in a Glass of Water. But before we get into the good stuff, on behalf of all of us here at Third Place Books, I just want to quickly thank you all so much for tuning in. For those of you who may not know, we are an independent bookstore with three locations in the Seattle area. We are having more and more of our events in person, which is so exciting, uh, but our online program is sticking around to connect authors and readers in a virtual space. So thank you all so much for tuning in and of course for buying books. Your support is what makes all of this possible. So if you haven't gotten your hands on any of the books that come up this evening and you would like to, I will be linking books in a chat for those of you in the Seattle area. Come on in, grab a copy off the shelf, or you can place an order online and come pick them up in store. Or if you're not local or not leaving the house, we of course ship. So go ahead and follow those links in chat over to our website. And while you're on our website, I definitely encourage you to check out some of our other upcoming events. We have an exciting roster coming up this fall. So if you'd like to stay in touch with our community, you can sign up for our newsletter. It's a weekly update about events and exciting releases our online book clubs and of course you can follow us on any of our major social media platforms we are at third place books for the quickest updates and recommendations uh, we are especially excited for this event tonight because how not to drown in a glass of water is the most recent pick for our subscription box the signed first editions club for those of you who are already members welcome we're so glad that you could join us um, if you don't know our signed first editions club delivers a hand selected signed first edition to your house every other month um, these are books that we really love and are excited to share so if you'd like more information about joining the signed first editions club i'll link more information in the chat uh, we would love it if you joined the club so keep an eye on that chat here in just a couple seconds um, for more information so tonight we're here for about an hour and towards the end we will be taking questions so if you have any questions which we very much hope that you do go ahead and leave those in the Q&A box which should be either at the top or bottom of your screen it's different than the chat box which is great for virtual applause and connecting with each other I absolutely invite you to share where you're tuning in from in the chat. Um, but when it comes time for questions, do make sure those end up in the Q&A so we can most easily find them. Uh, while you're in our chat and question spaces, I wanna remind you to please lead with kindness and refrain from any inappropriate behavior or harassment. And finally, should any technical issues arise, which can happen in the world of Zoom, uh, we will work as quickly as we can to resolve them. And we of course appreciate your patience and understanding. All right, so now it is time for us all to settle in because without further ado, I am so pleased to welcome Angie Cruz, author of How Not to Drown in a Glass of Water, of course, Soledad, uh, Let It Rain Coffee, and Dominicana, which was another third place book's favorite and was shortlisted for the Women's Prize and a Good Morning America book club pick. She is founder and editor-in-chief of, of Asterix a literary and arts journal and is an associate professor in of English at the University of Pittsburgh. In conversation this evening, I'm so excited to introduce Ayana Mathis, author of New York Times bestseller, The 12 Tribes of Hattie, which was an NPR books uh, of the year of 2013 and was chosen by Oprah Winfrey as the second selection for Oprah's book club 2.0. She's a graduate of the Iowa Writers Workshop, where she is now an assistant professor of English and creative writing. So the book this evening is How Not to Drown in a Glass of Water, which is a New York Times book review editor's choice and a most anticipated book of the year pretty much everywhere from the Washington Post to Good Morning America. Carolina de Robertes called this book a miracle and said, 
prepare to be astonished. Uh, third place booksellers have loved this book for so many reasons, but especially for its hilarious, fierce, and unforgettable protagonist. Uh, we cannot wait for you to meet her. So with that, I'm going to get out of your way. Thank you all so much for being here. Audience members, do not be shy in chat or if you need anything. And with that, I'm going to pass the stage to our authors. So welcome, both of you. The stage is yours. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Hi Angie. Angel. How are you? So excited to see you. Hello. Hello. I'm here from here. I know. I know. I'm excited to see you too. Angie and I should be Angie first and friends. And so we have a lot of folks, which is very exciting. You know what? I'm hearing you hear something weird happening. Yeah. I, I think I'm, I'm strange, which I was not like just a second ago. <laughs> Do you hear, can you hear me? Maybe it'll go away. Let's see what happens. <laughs> I know. Let's hope for the best because it wasn't happening like before we went to our little break. Um, so let's hope the, the, the spirits of Zoom conversation will be with us. Yeah. Um, so I have a, trillions of questions, um, some of which I probably asked you when we were like, you know, eating in our neighborhood spot. But um, I'm gonna start with one that I know you're getting asked everywhere, all the time, constantly, but I have to, because Cara Romero, the protagonist of this book is so alive and so real and just jumps off the page. I got to ask you, like, how did this woman come to you? What is the evolution of Cara Romero? Um, you know, I actually, first I want to show the book. This is the book. <laughs> um, I started this book in 2017 while I was on the subway in New York City on a platform. And I myself, now in retrospect, you see, I wasn't very conscious of it at the time, but in retrospect, I was also, like Cara Romero, thinking of starting an entire new life. Um, I was full of despair. Trump was president. And um, it was one of these days where everyone was like really being hard on New York City. And I was thinking, do I really want to continue writing? Is this the best thing I could do with my time and energy when our country seemed to be falling apart. And, um, and I saw this woman on the subway, um, like reading some kind of handbook or ESL kind of manual. And I started thinking of all the women in my life who um, were laid off from their jobs during the Great Recession. And they had been working in the same factory um, or offices for like 20, 25 years. And they were asked to start over at the age of 55 when our economy was a collapsing. And how hard that would be without knowing the language or, with, or, or not being familiar with the digital world. And, and there she came to me like, one, I said, you know, I don't know, should I be doing this writing business? And then, I, and then Cara Romero basically started speaking to me. She, the first line of the book is actually the line I wrote down on my phone that day, which was, my name is Cara Romero. I came to this country because my husband wanted to kill me. She came name and all. She named name all. the whole exactly thing. Exactly like this. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, and then I said, okay, I'm going to listen to what you have to say to me. Because in that moment, I really did feel lost. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, I mean, I guess the other thing is like, so she's so full. She's so rich. She's sort of, it's almost like she sort of was this kind of runaway train, right? And so the wonderful thing about her is that we read the novel and she feels like this entirely sort of organic being, um, which of course she is in the world of the novel. But I think the thing that's important to say is, right, lest we forget that it takes skill and craft and things like this to actually make this voice that's inside of you and inside of your head and that's speaking to you into something that's legible for the rest of us. Um, mm -hmm. So I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about that process of bringing her to life on the page, even after or as she was sort of channeling through you. 
Well, you know, I think that um, it's true that in some ways, I think of Cara Romero, when people talk about the book, they speak about as if Cara Romero wrote the book. Mm -hmm. But I wrote the book. Exactly. <laughs> That's all the credit, taking all the credit for your hard work. And, I said, <laughs> and in some ways, it's the greatest compliment you could give a writer that someone feels so vivid that they can't even imagine that it's a, a figment of someone's imagination. But, you know, I mean, the, the book took many years and there were many different versions of it. And the first version happened to be me listening to the character and allowing whatever it is that came to me that, you know, comes from the subconscious, comes from all, you know, all the stories I've heard in my life. I just wrote everything down. It was like the shittiest sure. draft you can imagine with some really beautiful gems in it. Mm -hmm. Then I, I was like, wait, can I really write a book where someone is just speaking? like in a monologue, like that belongs in a play or it belongs in theater. So I wrote other versions of the book where Lulu was telling the story. Mm -hmm. And Cara's pieces were just transcripts. And then I wrote another version where the interviewer was actually really present in the book. Mm -hmm. And then what I realized is none of these other voices I was writing was as strong as Cara. Like Cara kept taking the mic and mm -hmm. wanting the show to herself. And I thought, okay, well, how can I bring in all that new information I now have about all these different characters that I've written, but fuel, like fuse it inside the voice of Gada and what she's saying. Yeah. So when you're reading Gada, you think you're just reading Gada, but actually you're also reading all these different characters that I've been thinking about and actually wrote out pretty much. Mm. But I so entered it all into her point of view. Wow. So were there even characters that are that sort of didn't make it into the final cut? Like, are there people that have been oh, sort yes. of removed entirely? Oh, yes, because in the first draft, Gada would tell me about every person that ever came across in her life. And a novel is not a person's life. You know what I mean? Yeah, a, novel, yeah. <laughs> a novel is like, you know, in its own, it's, it's like its own ship. And I had to really carve out a life in 12 weeks, right? Like what can we possibly know about a person in these 30 minute sessions? And I actually created all these constraints to mm -hmm. sort of, I guess, give me more freedom with how, what you can say. I created different kinds of constraints so it could be wild on the inside, right? So the constraints were 12 sessions and I committed to it. You mm -hmm. know, that means 12 weeks. So what can really happen in 12 weeks? What could really happen in 30 minutes? None of the sessions go past 30 minutes, mm -hmm. right? So in that, I was able to do a lot, right? Yeah, it's interesting how sometimes limitations are, are actually kind of freeing in this weird way, you know what I mean? Like, I feel like in the beginning part, as you were talking about in the sort of initial drafting phase, just letting yourself be wild and just hearing everything that this woman had to say to you, was so essential, but then it seems as though giving yourself limitations and parameters is actually what sort of freed you to make this book into something that we could receive. In an, in, and it's just interesting how it works that way so often. I think in the space of play, you know, I have, I'm a mother and I feel like watching my, like, you know, when I would have Danielle, my son on the beach, for example, where there were no borders, to the space he can play, the way he interacted, let's say, with sand mm. was very different than when there was a sandbox, mm. mm -hmm. right? And I keep, and I think in some ways, if you think about the novel and form, right, like what it's doing is that it's allowing to take the material of language and to just form it in a different way. It gives you a different kind of um, entry into the material. Mm -hmm. Then you have a constraint, whatever that is, right? Yeah. Like you could imagine there's a lot of different ways to think of constraint in mm -hmm. form. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to, I mean, you sort of addressed this already, but you know, there's something like really daring about forming a novel that is essentially a series of monologues, right? Like in a, in a way, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I guess I have, you sort of already spoken to the kind of way that you crafted that. 
But I guess, you know, there's always in the audience, there's always writers and there's always aspiring writers who were thinking to themselves like, well, you know, how, how could I, how would I know if this instinct that I have to do a thing in this way is okay? How do I know to follow it? Because, and so I, I wondered if you could talk about that, like that sort of, that leaning into or trusting some of your instincts in kind of giving this whole book to this woman in a series of monologues. I mean, it's, a, you know, it's pretty unique and it's a choice that many other people may not have made. So I'm just curious about how you came to make it. You know, the truth is I didn't trust it immediately. I mean, mm -hmm. the first version of the book I was writing purely for myself. I spent four years trying to sell a book, the Minicana, and everyone was saying they wouldn't publish it. And I thought, oh, maybe my books will just be for me. I mean, there's many writers that write many stories that never get published. Yeah. And this particular story with Gada was really like a practice in listening um, to the the character that was coming to me, but also like just really having fun for the first time in a long time. I was actually, you know, I mean, Dominicana as, you know, as wonderful as I, you know, as the process of writing that book was, it wasn't fun. It was actually like a book that was incredibly challenging. It was connected mm -hmm. to some of my family stories. I mm -hmm. felt a lot of pressure because I was going up for tenure and I needed to get it into contract. You know, and Gabriel Garcia Marquez is this wonderful thing. He says, like, you want to kill your writing, like, give it a deadline. Like, you know, put another pressure outside of, like, that other thing that could happen, which is really the joy of, of, of storytelling and why we tell story. And yeah. I feel like in that, like, when you say, oh, how does a writer know to follow their instinct? Like, if we're really honest with ourselves, we know what works. And we know it even when we tell someone else about what we're writing. Because mm -hmm. as soon as we start talking about our work, we realize where we're lying. Right. right. You know, we're right. like, oh, God, I'm bullshitting myself. I'm bullshitting you. Like, right. Right. you know, right. like we know it. And we know when someone's lying to us mm -hmm. when they're telling a story. That's why when good gossip is good, it's really good. Because, you yeah, know, right. like they're telling you something and you want to, you know, you want to, you want all the tea, you know. And like, I think. There's something about that that is really discouraged in the intellectual, like a mapping and in, in schools where they say, oh, forget about embodied intelligence. Mm -hmm. Forget about these things that come easy, like, or mm -hmm. come easy. You know, like you got to be all brainy about it. But in some ways, a lot of that work to me mm -hmm. looks dead on the page. It's super smart. It's clever. clever. It's really clever. <laughs> but is it alive? You know, yeah. Cara Romero is telling people what to buy at the supermarket these days. <laughs> right? Like I have people writing to me saying, oh my God, I was at the supermarket and I bought jasmine rice because Cara Romero says it's better and I realize she's a fictional character. And why am I buying rice based on a fictional character? Right. They had to with someone who told them that. Right, right. right. And I'm like, hey, like, that's pretty cool. <laughs> it is. It's pretty amazing, right? I mean, it, it, it's incredible. I think, you know, the thing, one of the things I wanted to ask you, and you just kind of segued to it perfectly, was about storytelling. You know, I mean, it, it feels to me often that storytelling is sort of, as you were saying, it's kind of, it's like, it's a little bit, um, you know, it's like, it's like high art versus folk art, you know what I mean? <laughs> Like there's high art, which is important and wonderful and lofty and intellectual. And then there's folk art, which is like stuff that people make because, you know, whatever, right? Like there's, it's, it's very, in the hierarchy of art, it really isn't. And I, and I feel like there's like the, 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 the act of storytelling has gotten a little bit, um, it's a bit disparaged. It's a little bit, um, and I can't figure out, I, and I just wanted to talk about that a little bit. I mean, you've, you've already touched on it, but what this this sort of um, urge against storytelling in, in contemporary literature seems to be about, or even if you find that to be the case, maybe you don't. Well, you know, when I went to the MFA at NYU, um, it was a very different time, right? This was in the 1990s, mm. late 1990s. And, and I remember workshopping my work and literally in an, a mostly white class, they would read my work, not having had any, you know, real experience reading any Latin American writers or, you know, Caribbean writers. And they would say things like, I don't know if it's good because it's colorful 
or because it's actually good. Like they couldn't get past the way I used language, the way I was code switching, mm -hmm. the way I was telling story, the long sentences, the tangents, the digressions that are really mm -hmm. common in Spanish. And at the time I was like, okay, well, I'm going to really try to figure out how to tell a story with just one person. What am I going to do with all the people in the room? I don't know, but I'm really going to try. And I was like banging my head against the wall for years, trying to sound like Raymond Carver, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and thinking, oh, this is the only way to be an American writer to some degree. And, um, and in reality, like what I think has happened you know it, it it was like wow like i didn't realize that i was actually being taught by the greatest storytellers that i've ever met which are a lot of the women in my family mm -hmm. and i discredited it and that for a very long time because it wasn't validated right like it's folk tales or oh you know but actually or it's gossip you it's know, or whatever, right? Or it's 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 not you know literary or academic but actually that intelligence Mm -hmm. of how to communicate story so fully embodied. Thank God for Toni Morrison who talks about this and all the different black writers that I love like Gloria Naylor and, you mm -hmm. know, um, I mean, Toni Kate Bambara who mm -hmm. challenged this notion that the American story should be of the individual, you know, full of interiority and a lonely, <laughs> lonely, right, right. lonely people's moving in the world, you know, right, right. Where there's nothing else. Thank God, because I feel like in the end, those were the people I were speaking to. But in academia, I felt incredibly isolated trying to tell the story the way I wanted to. So this book is a celebration of like leaning into that voice mm -hmm. and just mm -hmm. trusting that voice that I've been training to do all my life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was like, as you were talking, I was thinking too about the, the sort of, you know, I, I, I was thinking mostly about this, the kind of, the word that came to mind as you were talking was like this kind of maximalist mm -hmm. mode of not a sort of, of writing certainly, but, but of experiencing the world, right? As, a, as opposed to this kind of minimalist one, which I think is the one that is prized much more often in contemporary American literature. And I was you know, sometimes when I'm teaching, um, you know, I, I, I'll say to my students, you know, the problem often in life is not not enoughness, it's too muchness. And it feels very often like this book felt like a book that was about too muchness, you know, in this like, richness and detail and voice. And so it's just, it's, it's, um, it's interesting to me that that way that 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 um, that denigration of what is for most people, frankly, the reality, right? Like most people aren't like, oh, there's nothing. You know, like most people are, have a very different experience of being alive. Um, so I, that wasn't really a question, but it was sort of a, like a thank you and, and, and how lovely it is to sort of see that really brought artfully onto the page. And you know what the thing is, and I love to say this to my students as well, is that no, not everyone's going to love your book, right? Like I love, you know, books that are set in India. I'm interested in books set in the Caribbean. They speak, you know, like maximalist writing really speaks to me mm. as, as well as minimalist. I mean, I love a lot of minimal writers and I For read sure. a lot of writing in general, but not everyone is going to feel and get your book. No. That's just the reality and thank god there's so many books and thank god there's so many of us and yeah. and the thing is you just have to write the story you want mm -hmm. <laughs> and 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 just trust deeply that someone is gonna want to receive it right in the same ways that you've wanted to receive it mm -hmm. um and that's also really freeing yeah not everyone's gonna like it it's okay yeah yeah absolutely um so there's one of the things I was, we, we, we write very differently, but we have both written books that feature um, mothers who are, what's the word? I always use the term the failed mother, um, but, but I have to be careful with that term because then people think that I mean that, that the mother is sort of a, unworthy or a lesser human being. But really what I mean is somebody who is really struggling with motherhood and perhaps the way they love is not being... Um, recognized or received as love by the object of that love. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit about writing about a failed mother or a struggling mother. Um, yeah. 
Um, yeah, I mean, this book, Mothering is at the center of it. Um, there are many different kinds of mothers in the book and they're um, butting heads mm -hmm. around how they should be mothering their children. Um, and interestingly, a lot of them are boys, right? So it's also about like how these women are mothering their sons. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like the idea of failed is, is literally also a construction, right? Because what is failure is also part of some kind of agreed definition of what is success, mm -hmm. right? And I would say that, as I've been seeing with people who've been reading my book, that some people think Cara Romero was right all along. Like, there's nothing failing. <laughs> because, you know, when someone is in full agreement with something, mm -hmm. they're not going to see it as a failure. Right. Right. That what, whatever choices she made with her son, they're not going to see it as a failure because they feel like I had no other choice. God, I had no other choice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, yes, maybe what she did could have been done differently, but could she have done it differently without the resources that maybe someone like myself has, which is I have mm -hmm. access to therapy and books and educate like a certain mm -hmm. kind of education around parenting. That someone like Gara, who's working like six days a week and taking care of half of the building and like, right, you know, right. like, does she have the resources, mind, time, heart to actually have done some of these terrible, like raising her son was just terrifying for her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when I think about failure, I think, wow, like what are, what are the expectations we have on women and mothers given the circumstances when we know that all these things patriarchy sexism misogyny abuse racism xenophobia all mm -hmm. of it is something that we're challenged by constantly and always mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know and also, it's interesting about it too because i mean i think the wonderful thing about 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 Cara romero which I'll, I'll sort of talk ask a little more hopefully we won't run out of time later but you know she she is all of the, you know, she's sort of being squeezed by all of these forces that you were just talking about, but she's also herself, right? So like herself with that personality made that set of choices, right? Both inevitably because of the, the you know, these pressures on her and also because of who she is. Um, and I, I, so that, that, that also like the way that she mothers, it also seems like it's being really contrasted with the way her mother mothered and the way her sister mothers. Um, and both of those women, Kara and her sister, have the same mother, they have the same background, but they are very different in the way that they are like approaching the raising of their children. Um, so, I, it, and that just seems really interesting to me too, like, like all of these sort of contrasting ways of mothering um, that are in this book and, and, and maybe sort of what that's saying or what it's speaking to or what it's about, it's, aside from just being adding so much richness and texture. Yeah, you know, I thought it was really important to bring in the stories of their mother, mm -hmm. show like why they have tensions with each other and also the inheritance of mm -hmm. years, generations of abuse that, you know, it are linked to patriarchy and the limited choices women have, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like you, I couldn't, you know, it's so funny because, you know, most of mainstream television and movies never mention the parents or like, you're, you're just like, all these people are living without, but I can't even imagine. Yeah, from an egg or something, yeah. right? <laughs> I don't know. Like, people just hatch. I say, what's up with Americans? Like, don't they have family or, or, or struggle with not having that? Like, what, you know? Yeah. And, you know, I can't even imagine telling my story without somehow talking about my mother, my grandmother, my great grandmother, it's like weird. Um, so of course it's in the book as well to show kind of like the lineage mm -hmm. and how we keep trying to change. Like they are mm -hmm. somehow improving, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. how yeah. they're navigating, um, raising a child in this world that is terrifying. Mm -hmm. God is also terrified for her son. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, she's so clearly like in the beginning, she's just kind of like, she's just, she's like, you can't be soft. Like she's like, she can't imagine what that means. It, the world would do to him if he were that. 
She's afraid of everything. The cops, what the cops will do to him, what the gangs would do with him, like what the world would do with him. <laughs> like every aspect of the world is terrifying. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the one of the things that it sort of made me think about too is like, I mean, there's so much love in the book, you know, and I think it's I think it's one of the reasons that even though you know, cut us not easy, right? Which is a nice thing, actually, right? Like, it's nice to read a character that isn't easy. Um, but I think one of the the sort of the successes of the book is that she's not easy, but she's fully, she's fully human. And she's sort of being handled with love, but love interpreted perhaps not as like, oh, well, we just, you know, let you off the hook for everything, but like a, a gaze that is like honest and probing and wants to see her. Um, and she sort of handled so beautifully in that way. And I was thinking too about how much of the book is about is about people's um, about people taking care of one another, um, and about and about both that sort of working in in ways that it helps form community, and also in ways that it it doesn't work right. Like that the, the this care extended that the other person doesn't recognize as care or refuses. So there's a lot of this going on and sometimes this, which I thought was really interesting. And I just don't, I don't know if you have any thoughts about that or. I mean, I think about it a lot. I think about like the, the conflict between trying to um, live in a world that validates the individual and sort of also blames the individual. Every mm -hmm. failure is blamed on the individual and every success is, is, is validated and kind of like celebrated as the individual versus thinking about the we, right? Like, what does it mean when your success is actually a community success or family success um, mm -hmm. or a failure is everyone takes, does a little bit of lifting in that failure. And mm -hmm. I feel like when I bring in all these characters and show how they're super interdependent, like mm -hmm. the truth is that her sister Angela, without her sister, without Cara's help, could never have bought a house, even yeah. dream of buying a house. Like she needed the free child care. She needed Cara to step in as like the auntie. Um, she needed the support. Um, and it's really complicated, right? Because in the end, this support that Cara is doing for her sister will also be something that estranges them from each other. Yeah. Because the sister wants to move away. And yeah. I yeah. wanted to show like just how complex that is. You know, as, as someone who, when I went to college, I remember that as soon as I let, went away to college, like I created this huge canyon between me and my mother. Mm. Suddenly mm. I became the educated one or like one who would come back with all these big ideas and try mm. to cancel my whole family, you know, right. for saying the wrong thing constantly. And right. I was so right. not generous. And I guess in some ways, like this book is about when you say love, it's like handling, handling people with generosity. Mm -hmm. Because I feel like there I go, I read these books, I, I, I feel all woke. And then I come back and I look at everyone like, they don't know what they're talking about, but mm -hmm. it's actually not true. Mm -hmm. It's just that I went in a I went on a journey where I learned very differently mm -hmm. and they haven't had that opportunity. Right. Mm -hmm. and I guess like what I'm asking with this book is take this journey and get to know this person, not only for like the first thing they say, but from everything they do. Right. Mm -hmm. Like we are more than what we say. We're also mm -hmm. our actions. That's why I love what Bell Hooks said. Lo love is a verb. Mm -hmm. You know, like mm -hmm. sometimes you don't say I love you, but you show love in different ways, right? Mm -hmm. You cook a meal, you, you know, you go with someone to a doctor, you, you're kind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's wonderful. Like as you were saying this and I, I was thinking about how much it's just very interesting. This isn't a question. It's more of a, just an observation um, and a real sort of testament to the sort of feet of the book, which is that this entire book is a woman talking, but actually it is really about what she does and what she doesn't do and what everyone does and doesn't do. You know, I mean, she has false narratives about herself. She has true narratives about herself. She has, you know, um, and so it's it's really lovely. And I, I, I guess this brings me back to, in thinking about writing like such a, a a book again that's just monologues in a way how you manage to help us to sort of see around kata when she's like talking shit 
to see around her when she is actually for her own safety and survival has held on to a false idea about herself but we are always able to see around her. So I just, I wondered if you could talk about that a little bit. It's really interesting how the book is able to do that. I think that if I wouldn't have written the other points of view, like, you know, I always call this radical, like I, 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 in my MFA classes, I'll say, okay, it's, there is the shortcut to something is sometimes radical inefficiency, which is like the long way around, which seems like you're wasting time actually is the shortcut to the truth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to the that you need to make something work and I feel like spending that time writing from Lulu's perspective that mm -hmm. could have been seen a failure or a waste of time because that did take a year of my life <laughs> of writing uh -huh. I think that that helped me do that thing right where now people are reading God and, and a number of people bringing up how they're seeing like it's almost like you're seeing this person in all their sides, mm -hmm. right? All these different perspectives, but she's the only one speaking. And I guess mm -hmm. also the documents, right? The documents play an important uh, role in the book because in some ways these documents say a lot about her life and also work mm -hmm. as a counter narrative, mm -hmm. right? So they help sort of help us see like what is true and what is not true about mm -hmm. what she's saying about herself. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Thank you. I'm glad you brought that up because I was going to ask about the documents and I was thinking about the ways in which she'll be like, oh, I'm just a tiny, tiny bit behind on the rent. But then actually, as we discover, she's a lot behind, you know, I mean, that's one example, but there are all these ways in which those documents, yeah, create this kind of counter narrative. Was that, how did that kind of come into the process using documentation like that? Um, you know, I, I feel like I'm always um, wrestling with documents <laughs> myself. <laughs> And as a person that was helping, you know, families, like my family tra um, translate and work through their, their documents, like we were the doctors and filling out forms and they would just give me the form and I would be filling out the forms or, you know, going through the computer and answering these security questions and like unable to answer any of these questions. And I was like, well, what was the name of your, your maiden name? I don't know. And then like you had to like, no, we're not never going to remember that one. Okay. What is yeah, right. it? Like, what, what's the phone number, your childhood phone number? They were like, we would go to the store. Like, you know, we yeah, wouldn't have that. We didn't have that. Yeah. <laughs> so I think like, since this has been a reality in my life for so long, like, mm -hmm. and knowing how important documents are as a way to keep us in and also keep us out mm -hmm. of certain spaces, um, and also the kind of security certain documents mm. make people feel, I was like, okay, let me play with this. Let me have some fun with this. And then once I started, I just couldn't stop. I was like, oh my God, like the lease, the, you know, just couldn't. And then I, and then I also, I, you know, I was evicted from an apartment in New York city, um, mm. like 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I remember that experience was a lot because I didn't know my rights. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, the way I tried to write, the way I wrote the documents was to explain to people that are reading the book, their rights. <laughs> so yeah. if you're reading it, you also understand that there are ways that you can keep your apartment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because I didn't have that cultural capital to understand that I could have kept that apartment. Right. And in some ways I'm like, what, why is this culture so invested in kicking us out? Mm -hmm. They don't want us to have access to that information. So the documents are also working subversively to get, mm -hmm. to educate people and to help them see, like, it's almost like sharing resources from bad experiences. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking, I mean, there's all these really like, like we're just talking about, right? Like sharing resources from bad experiences and that we know that Kata at one point is almost going to get evicted. And there's all, there's a lot of um, intense, really difficult things that are happening to her and have already happened to her, you know, sort of before we meet her in her sessions. But there's some, there's such a, um, like a light touch here, you know? Um, and so I, I was, and in part of that, I guess, obviously, is being achieved by Kara's voice, you know, but also it's just funny. It's a funny book. 
Um, and it's sometimes it's funny about things that are so dark. And I wanted to ask you, I think we still have enough time, like one minute to do it. I wanted to ask you to read very briefly. There's a little section on page 69 in which something very dark is being talked about, but in a really wonderful way. And, I, I, and maybe that's a good place for us to end before we get to questions. Okay. Okay. I'm going to read a little bit from my book. Okay. Um, all right. Her son Adonis is in trouble. But not a little trouble, big trouble. Adonis lost his apartment. Her son, the big professional that was making four, five times what we made in the factory, lost his apartment in Brooklyn with a view of Manhattan. Tell me you, didn't he see those people in the news that lost their houses and are camping in the highway? What was he thinking? He bought his apartment, all of it, with a loan. Even his down payment was a loan. The banks call it a balloon, and it popped. The party is finished for Adoni. <laughs> and there we have the subprime mortgage process crisis, according to Cara Romero, um, <laughs> which I think is so wonderful. And I, I guess it's a this is we're, we're going to open it up to questions. Um, but I wondered if you if we might end on this sort of light touch with the darkness here and the humor. Um, <laughs> and if you could talk about that very briefly before we transition to letting other people in. You know, I was, you know, just earlier talking to this, um, a, D a Dominican writer friend of mine, Lisette Norman, and she was saying, she goes, oh, I love my people because we laugh even when things are tragic. I mean, right now, you know, there's a hurricane that just hit Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I call my family and they're just like, oh, we lost the roof, but you know, we're fine. <laughs> and you're, and they're laughing. And I'm just like, wait, this is tragic, right? But there's a way that laughter helps you survive. And I feel that when, you know, someone like Cara Romero, I bring up, yes, what happened with the mortgages, but everything like the Airbnb started during that time mm -hmm. and they're watching all this stuff happen. But at the same time, they know that they're in it together. And I feel like um, that also allows for kind of humor and lightness and laughter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that sense of, you know, James Baldwin talks about it a lot. He, and he's talking about it in like an African American context, but that sort of laughing at um, the kind of the, the sort of the unanticipated reaction to very difficult things, which is laughter, are also the unanticipated things like joy in like, re, you know, because I think the laughter isn't just about Oh, this is a coping mechanism. It's also real, right? Like it's you know that I think very often there's this kind of tendency to think that people who are in difficult situations are sort of living in a dirge. You know what I mean? Like that's just woo, you know, all the time. But they're like the joy, even in in spite of because of whatever these really really hard realities is also really real. And I and I loved that about the book too, right? Like the the realness of, you know, like her and those damn pastelitas. I was like, God, I don't know, stop telling me about how good your pastelitas are. You know? But like, there's all this, like, it's so funny, but it's also just like, there's joy there, you know, like there's pride and, and um, there's just, that's a really wonderful sort of thing about the book and it happens throughout and it feels like it allows you to talk about some of these dark things without weighing us down like you can go all these places through this joy and this humor and this lightness mm -hmm. thank you so, yeah yeah i need laughter i wanted to laugh during the trump presidency i looked for as much laughter as possible oh, yeah totally <laughs> all right let's keep happening we have like one only one question the um q a and then we've got a million questions in the chat all right so um uh, oh, it's kind of the question I just asked. So if you if you you might have already answered it. Um, this is from Rina, who is Dominican from the Bronx. She says, um, "Thank you so much for writing voices that feel like home to me. I've read all your books and was fully prepared to cry because of a main character's death. What inspired you to make this narrative lighter and even comical?" I mean, it's 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 the. I mean, I don't think. I could write in a Dominican voice without constant laughter. <laughs> it's just humor is so intrinsic in the way that we communicate with each other. In my experience of being Dominican, I'm sure there's many different experiences of being Dominican, but in my experience of Dominicanness, I feel like even when things are very hard, the music is playing, the food <laughs> is being made, 
you know, and someone has a bigger tragedy to share. And in some ways that's the title, right? It's like um, the way that I hear that the most, like how not to drown in a glass of water comes from the, the expression, no te ahogues en un vaso de agua, which is don't drown in a glass of water. And usually that is told to me when I actually do have reason to be drowning, right? right, right. I'm like, I broke my toe, I can't get to work. And they're like, you're drowning in a glass of water. Let me tell you, when I was a kid and I was five years old, I had to carry three buckets on my head. A nail went through my foot. I still <laughs> made it in time to school. <laughs> Don't be drowning in a glass of water. And I'm like, really? Like, do you have no empathy for what's happening to me right now? <laughs> you know? Yeah, no, it's, 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 it's interesting. Like the, the generations before, you know, you're like, this happened and that happened. They're like, well, let me tell you, you know, and it's, and the thing is, it's weird is that you're just like, sometimes you're like, oh, wow. Well, yeah, you're right. You know? <laughs> you're right. Yeah, you're <laughs> fine, you know? yeah. <laughs> um, people are being shy with questions. So whoever's out there, please send some questions into us. We would love to answer them. In the meantime, I guess I'll ask more questions. Are you sick of my question today? I'm just going to ask more questions. Sure. Um, I want to ask a question that I didn't get to, which was about the building. I mean, the building and the people in the building are essentially a character or characters, I suppose. Um, but I mean, they're just such a presence. There's such a presence in the in the book of the building where Kara and Tita and everybody live. Um, and so I wondered if you could talk about how that came to be, how the building came to be so important, and also about kind of writing multiple, you know, sort of big casts of characters. I mean, it's something, you may, and sometimes maybe it's background, you know, I'm an only child of a single mom. I find very hard to have a lot of people in a room. It's very difficult. It's challenging for me. So I wonder if you could talk about, uh, talk about that a little bit. Well, I mean, I think it's um, definitely like for me, my experience of being in an apartment for most of my formative years was always having people in the apartment that I, a lot of people I didn't even know, right? I would come in and I would be like, who is that sitting there? And they were like, oh yeah, he just, you know, he has an appointment in three hours. He had nowhere to go. So he's sitting on the sofa. He's the cousin of this person and that person. And I'm like, okay, you know, like these random kids would just walk in and just sit on the couch. And, you know, so I'm, I grew up in a space that felt really like, had a lot of movement of people mm. so while one conversation is happening there was another conversation happening at the same time mm. um, and I it is really challenging I want to say to mm. write those narratives with multi big casts but you know at the same time I do think that I've learned a lot in, you know they call them the Catholic writers like Gladry O'Connor you mm -hmm. know like she was like, I'm a Catholic writer. And, and I was like, oh yeah, this is why I love Larry O'Connor stories because <laughs> there is a way. And I always thought about how your spiritual formation mm. impacts your aesthetics. For sure, deeply. Because the minimalism also is connected with the ways that we, we pray or we, or we learned mm. how to be in worship, right? Mm -hmm. And the Catholics really are maximalists. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, I feel that way that I saw the world, senses and everything, totally informs the work. So the building, to me, is very mm -hmm. much like writing about the building is actually showing how interconnected this community is, but also it embodies that maximalist um, aesthetic culture that I'm interested in. Yeah. I mean, and, and, and just even on a technical level, it's just there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of choreography when there's a lot of bodies and voices to move around in the world of the fiction. So it's, um, and I think it's something that's really challenging for, for lots of people. Um, do you, this sort of weird question, and hopefully it won't put you on the spot, but are there, um, you just mentioned Flannery O'Connor, have there been sort of writers that have been teachers for you in that way and sort of looking at like, okay, what do, how do I manipulate all of these voices in this kind of maximalist canvas that I have here? Like, have there been sort of go-tos for you that have kind of helped you to do that or how, helped you think about it? Definitely Toni Morrison, Song of Solomon, um, Kira, um, Anita Desai. I don't know if you've ever read her, but she oh. has like big, uh, big families, big characters, uh, lots of characters. Um, but you know, the, the, 
it's a different, you know, every book has its own challenges, right? So I think when you have a big cast for those who are writers, like I literally, um, when I was revising, I would have like many outlines of each character mm. and make sure that they were weaving in through the book, right? Because what could happen is that you lose a character completely. You know, like you could be writing yeah, the yeah. Oh, what happened to that character? And you set that up. So now you have to bring it back, right? right. So it's literally like a braiding mm -hmm. that I would do. And sometimes I worked on them separately and then I would weave them together. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah. That's I think, we have, I think uh, we have more questions. We do, we do. We got some. So we have now, um, this is um, Marie Pascal and she has said, how do you manage the two cultures? That is talking about Dominican culture in the English language. How do I manage two cultures talking about Dominican culture in the English language? I mean, I feel like because I grew up in, a, in Washington Heights, which was predominantly Dominican, and I traveled back and forth to Santo Domingo um, for the first 17 years of my life. And the same cast of characters in my life were constantly traveling back and forth. I always say that I lived in two countries, one kitchen. Mm -hmm. So you would be in the kitchen and you would forget, are you in New York or are you in Dominican Republic? Right, right. <laughs> in some ways, like, even though I'm writing about a culture that you know, that I wasn't born into, I feel like I lived the Dominican experience very deeply because I was constantly moving back and forth. Mm -hmm. So, and I feel that informs the work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Amaris Castillo says, hi, Angie, I love your book. Thank you for writing it. May I ask where you got the idea of Alicia the Psychic? Uh, you know, initially, First of all, I knew that I needed to bring in, you know, the ways that horoscopes and how it impacts the lotto and dreams, the everyday lives of so many people in my life. Mm -hmm. um, like one of the first questions I would be asked when I woke up was like, what did you dream, right? Mm -hmm. And then I would tell my dream and then someone would say, oh, I'm going to play that number, right? Mm -hmm. So I thought, how do I put this in the book for it to make sense? Um, but then I also wanted to incorporate this, like the novelty of the internet for mm. Gara and um, and what it brings, how, what it gave access to her, mm -hmm. uh, what, and what, what it allowed access for her to do. And when she did Elisa the Psychic, I was like, hey, that is a real thing. So I got a, I had a robot psychic and I was surprised at how I looked forward to these letters by the robot myself as I was researching the book and I thought hey like this actually works like you know <laughs> you were someone who was incredibly vulnerable like Gada <laughs> right and who needed to believe like how would this play into her character so basically like I and myself and Gada both went on the adventure mm. of the psychic and me really trying to think about like are they scams like how do they work how do people fall into them so, um, but definitely, um, I was interested in psychics and the role they have as alternates to therapy and conversation. Mm, mm, okay, yeah. Um, this is from Shanice Cruz, and she says, I loved Kara so much. She reminded me so much of the women in my family, <clears throat> excuse me, specifically my grandmother. And I was wondering if you were aware of how Kara, without formal education, still showed such an important member of the roles of women in our lives who make such huge sacrifices for us to achieve our dreams. The way that it was captured was so beautiful, by the way. Um, so what is the question? I, mean, I, think that it, I think the nugget of the question is like, um, how Kara without a lot of formal education was still such a kind of force and was such, a, um, such an important, um, I don't know, mirror, I think almost it's saying for the women in our lives who make huge sacrifices for us to achieve our dreams. I mean, yeah, I mean, she doesn't have formal education, but she obviously is so capable of doing so many things. And this is why it was really fun. everything. I'm like, there's nothing she can't do. What could she not do? Like, it was so fun to write like the career, like when she took the career test of what career fit her, because mm -hmm. in reality, if you give someone like God an opportunity, she probably could rise up to the occasion to almost yep. do anything. <laughs> yep. Yep. And I really do believe that so much about 
this world is opportunity, right? Like being given opportunity and having the patience to train someone, the possibilities of what someone could do is a lot. And if you look at her own life, like she does a lot already, right? Mm -hmm. But it's invisible and um, usually not validated as qualities that an employer would say, wow, come in here and, you know, and be the emergency, you know, disaster relief person. <laughs> right, right, exactly, exactly. Which, but of course she would probably do a lot yeah, better job than yeah. many, right? Yeah. And she would be perfect. I would, one would feel better in a disaster if Kara was around, yeah, right? Of course. <laughs> um, all right, so very last question. This is from Vina Castillo. Hi, huge fan of your work. I read Kara's story as a, as a hardcover and as an audiobook. Such an amazing production. How much involvement did you have in that? Is that, and is it how you envisioned it? You know, it's funny because the first um, year that I worked on the book, I actually, because I was just working on it on my phone and just for myself, I actually would record it, record mm -hmm. the little sections and send it to some friends. Mm -hmm. And when those friends would say, you know, wait, do you have another one? I want to hear another one. Then I would do it again. I would write another one. And in some ways, recording the little sections of Gada really kept me at it in this very mm -hmm. difficult year of my life. I don't mm -hmm. think I would be able to write it if I didn't know how to someone that wanted to listen to it. And so for me, because I had all these recordings of myself reading these sections, I had a very specific voice in my head. Mm -hmm. But I knew that I couldn't be the audio book narrator because I, even though I heard myself, I'm not the person, I'm not Cara Romero. Right, right, right. So um, I didn't, I did know that I wanted a Dominican actress. Mm -hmm. I wanted someone that was middle-aged mm -hmm. mm -hmm. and I was very specific about that. And, you know, they were amazing and they found someone, um, they found Boquita, who happens to be a famous Dominican actress, comedian. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't what I imagined, but really, you know, she really embodies this character. So I'm really happy about it. Oh, it's so wonderful. Thank you, Angie. I think we are out of time. Thank you for everyone who tuned in and thank you so much for your questions. And thank you. <laughs> Hello, welcome. Uh, I am back, everybody. Um, so it's about time to call it a night, but I just want to take this last moment to say a huge, huge thank you to everyone that was here, for our speakers, uh, for anybody who would like to get your hands on a copy of How Not to Drown in a Glass of Water. I'm going to go ahead and relink it in chat. And voila. Um, let us know what you thought of tonight's event, either in person or on any of our social media. We always, always, always love to hear from you. Angie and Ayana, huge, huge thank you for being here. This conversation was so wonderful to listen in on. Uh, do you have any last things you'd like to share before we say goodnight? No, I just want to thank everyone for being here. Thank you, Ayana. What a, I love spending time with you. And thank you, Third Place Books. Thank you so much to everybody who tuned in and thank you also Third Place Books and yay, Angie. <laughs> yeah, yay, Angie. Thank you. <laughs> Alrighty, and with that, I'm gonna say good night. Shall we do the awkward waving thing? <laughs> good night, night everyone. Good night. <laughs>